Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jacek Żakowski, and I'll have the pleasure of uh, um, chairing the discussion about the future of liberal democracy in the region, namely in CEE. I can feel shivers down my spine when we have this topic announced because I haven't heard anything optimistic in this regard for many years. And I hope that we can discuss it with these wonderful panelists that are sitting in front of you. Thank you very much, Christian Crystal Mohaus, Senior Program Officer. Uh, welcome cordially, and he's going to give you an introduction to the topic. Uh, Dr. Barbara Brodzinska Mirowska, political scientists, uh, polls know her, at least those sitting here, because she appears in the media. She represents the chair of media communication and journalism at Nicolaus Copernicus University, Toruń, Kamila Gasiu Kichowicz is going to join us just she's just a few kilometers away from here so she should be here with us soon and I can tell you that she knows more or less the introduction so she'll be able to uh, be a part of the discussion and Detmar Daring Friedrich Norman Foundation for Freedom representative um, Ladies and gentlemen, we are short of time. This is why I'm speaking so fast, the fastest I can, because this is a truly hot topic, a plethora of research and millions of literature intervention, lots of books in the recent years on the future of liberal democracy, including liberal democracy uh, in our region. Let me mention basic titles, uh, the hot ones, if you ha have not read them. Fukuyama's Mark Leonard, uh, Wiek Niepokoju, Timothy Garton Ash in defense of liberalism. And uh, for those who have uh, been heated, uh, Patrick Denin, why liberalism failed. Here is our star. Welcome cordially. Kamila Gasiuk-Pichowicz. So, the debate is pretty advanced. If you have not read these books, uh, Concilium Civitas uh, has got Grzegorz Eckert's uh, text, uh, his Harvard representative, and speaks about fundamental problems related to liberal democracy as such. Simple information worth digesting and remembering uh, starting 2005 every year there are more declining democracies than uh, developing democracies so this democratic regression has continued for two decades and in our region only Estonia and Croatia have kept the quality of democracy without improving, so they have just retained the same level. In eight post-Soviet totalitarianism, only Kazakhstan has not lost these few attributes of democracy it used to have. This is the point we are in, and if you couple that uh, East and West is brought together by anti-liberalism international movement. What is happening in Italy, there is much to be afraid of, I believe. Having said that, I give floor to Crystal, who is going to scare you even more, and then we'll have to discuss what to do with it. The way that I've thought to frame this discussion is to look at an evidence base and data because a lot of the philosophies, the ideologies, and the choices that we make around what we agree and disagree with have to do with the information that we receive. And so in this case, we can have a combined bird's eye view of a few pieces of data and then we can ground a bit and tie together a lot of the conversations that have been 
taking place here in this room previously, also around propaganda, but also in other fora, um, for example, dealing with citizens' assemblies and unpack a little bit of this idea about what is the problem and where exactly are we in terms of our challenges. A lot has been said around um, what the challenge might be, and the word uh, of populism has come up a lot. And if I could please uh, show the presentation, I'll be able to advance the slides and also give you some um, ideas around this. So the data that I'm showing you here is around uh, a group based out of the University of Gothenburg. They're called the Variety of Democracy Institute. And what they do is benchmark democracy. And democracy is not one single thing. Democracy is not binary, you are democratic or you're not democratic. But there are very pluralist, pluralistic ways in which democracy is lived out. And the strength of that democracy is important. And so this institute has taken a look at various indicators. And we think about liberal democracy, everyone has a different idea in their mind. And sometimes people think about liberal democracy as an ideology, something that someone else thinks that has a particular insistence that you have to believe or not believe certain things. But what liberal democracy is in terms of benchmarking democracy is the relationship between the state and the people. And so if you think about autocracy as being the state um, there so that the people supply it with its power and fuel its power, that is sort of the extreme version of an autocracy. But if you think of a liberal democracy, and you may not like that word, but let's say the opposite extreme on the democratic side is where the state is there to serve the people. And so this is where in the spectrum between democracy and autocracy, this organization, this research institute, tries to place states. And here you can see a, um, how they've done it for 2015 and 2021, and I've highlighted Poland. The scale here is zero to one. Sometimes that's hard to think in 0.8 or 0.4 or what that means, but if you think of it in terms of 80% toward democracy or 41% toward democracy, maybe that's just a little easier to, to visualize. And you can see that in Poland, um, between these two years, 2015 and 2021, there's been a decline. Uh, if we look at that um, in terms of over time, then uh, we can see that from the beginning of the scale is 88, right? And the final um, data points are from 2021. We can see that there has been a turning point in Poland's um, health of democracy, if you will. And um, that turning point, you can see the decline is around 2016, there's a very big dip. And then you can also see that um, within under a decade, how much erosion or loss of democracy there has been. And you could sort of imagine if that trend were to continue, how many years it would take before we would get back to around 1988 on this scale. So I wanna talk about other data points and they're about perception. If you've been in this room in the previous session, you would have experienced a conversation around propaganda, information, disinformation. And um, one of the things that is uh, true about perception in 2022, um, it was a, a poll that was taken in Poland after Russia's war on Ukraine, is that 80% of Polish people would agree that the world is a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. And so we're living in a context of fear. And this is important when we try to navigate democracy because a context of fear is always a situation in which democracy can easily be eroded and it, it needs to be defended. This is because it's very easy to break society apart into us and them. And also 70% of Poles think that, th that their country is on the wrong track. So here you can see the same data points just as graphs in terms of fear and right track, wrong track. You can see it's a very strong opinion in the country that we, we see on these aspects. And then another data point on attitudes that I'd like to share is around trust in the Polish government and parliament. And you can see that there is very low trust in both institutions. And this gives us a sense of what is the playbook? What, are, what is the room for maneuver? 
for those who do not enjoy favorability. Um, it is always in a context of fear to seek out and point out enemies. We can see, though, in contrast, where trust is strong is in the EU and NATO. And so these institutions are actually enjoying greater trust um, than, than at the national level. One thing that I find quite worrisome that has to do with attitudes currently in, in um, countries here, like Poland, but also around the world, is the um, very, the, the, I think, relatively low, su consistent support for democracy. And I think that this is something that has gotten lost along the way when we are dealing with very clear, sort of higher level, everyday issues and problems. You know, what, how will I pay my energy bill? How will I put food on the table? You know, what is my security? That a lot of times um, the, the instinct is to go to a strong leader. I don't want to have a lot of time messing with parliament. You know, just give me someone who's going to solve my problems. And that is an illusion that erodes democracy, um, and, it, and it has historically. So um, another thing uh, just to point out here is about um, satisfaction with democracy pre and post um, Russian war on U Ukraine and Poland. And it's basically stayed pretty stable with a slight um, to tendency toward um, being uh, having decreased. So now the question is, what do we do, right? This is the point of the panel, and I'm coming around now with the data points to fuel a bit of our discussion, which is how do we get to a sense of stronger democracy, and what ways can the country and people in the country feel that they're on the right track? And one of the um, points here is about um, disinformation. So um, there is agreement that disinformation needs to be combated, and also um, there is a strong sense that growing inequality is eroding solidarity in the country. And I think this will feed in a lot to some of the work that fellow panelists are doing, is how do we actually change the situation on the ground for people so that this inequality doesn't break and tear at the country. And um, finally here, um, this feeds into so many other of the panels, but independent news, right? To have a strong independent media sector is one of the main ways to bolster democracy. And we can see in Russia that it's one of the main ways to um, stifle democracy. And so I think in Poland, it's very, very important that there is a healthy media landscape. And finally, I think uh, looking back at the data on the curve for the, the health of democracy, it's really important that the trend be <laughs> reversed because if that trend continues, you can imagine what the country might look like in a decade. Thank you. Bardzo dziękuję. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, short interventions, short comments, and your impressions with regards to the topic discussed here. Mr. Daring, the floor is yours. If you could comment. Uh, on Crystal's intervention and tell me what is your perception of the situation? First of all, uh, I would like to add that uh, the problems we have outlined here are not just Central European or Polish problems. We see many other, I haven't studied really this index, but if you look at others, Freedom House, Human Freedom Index, Ec uh, Economic uh, Freedom Index, uh, everything about privilege we have since in the last uh, years a decline of civic, economic, political freedoms worldwide. That seems to be, I think we, we, we can address it, okay, people are fearsome or somehow led to a wrong track uh, and we might come to the gloomy picture you uh, uh, did in the beginning. Well, of course, uh, there's no reason for big, big, big optimism, but there are sometimes some bright spots or so. Uh, one of the problems why liberal democracy uh, is facing opposition, 
such strong opposition from a nationalistic, somewhat authoritarian, anti-elitist, anti-globalist movement, if you can describe it like this way, often simply said populist, but I think that's a very imprecise term. Uh, I think it's uh, not an answer. That's just, these people don't give any answers to any problem because uh, putting back globalization, if you look at history, every period in history where this happened before World War I or before, even in the interwar years when the uh, nucleus of international institutions were disestablished. It ends in a catastrophe, cannot be a solution. But it's also a problem uh, 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 whether it is a response to something. And uh, well, of course, I do think that international institutions, especially the EU, never really grew up to the task uh, of post-89 world. And I think Ukraine may be, I, I, I dare to make not a prediction, but it's at least a chance that it happens, that Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine changed something of that. It had put Central Europe back on the map. Uh, before that, I think at least where I come from, from Germany, there was always a wish, vision that Central Europe, yes, okay, they, after 89, they joined the EU and they just integrate into the narrative of Western Europe. And that was certainly uh, not sufficient, I would say, and led to a distrust in the EU that is higher than in Western Europe because it, it, it was not their narrative, it, nothing based on German, French, uh, uh, all these kind of things. But I do think that people now recognize that Central Europe is more important uh, and that the EU may change. They have brought back defense issues on the agenda, which were bluntly ignored in Germany, uh, simply didn't exist. Uh, if there's a green development, the green de if, if there hadn't been war, the Green Deal would have been friction between Central Europe and the rest of Europe. Now we don't see it so clearly, but to combine, for instance, economic reasonableness with green change or so. There are many contributions Central Europeans can do. and. Uh, I think the populist forces are not invincible if we start a discussion about the purpose of Europe again. And the ball is somehow in the field of all liberal globalists. And I think that if I look at the opposition to populist forces, if you call them like this, I have more hope in Central Europe. I think they are more liberal minded. They still are based on an anti totalitarian. Uh, 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 consensus, which in Germany, for instance, has evaporated. It's not there anymore. There can be ministers of states saying that the GDR was not an unjust state without being punished by published opinion. So I think uh, you have to do your own work, but I think it has started a new discussion on what Europe is good for. And this is the our chance, because the others will not contribute to it. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a feeling that we started a more serious conversation on democracy and what we can do with that. After 50 years of EU presence, they discovered the media worth tackling with. They started preparing the Freedom of Speech Directive, which is a breakthrough. Only recently, uh, when we were speaking about getting EU money to support, support media in EU member states, there was the strong doctrine, never ever will we touch it. So this is kind of optimistic. Although, on the other hand, the freedom erosion does not apply only to liberal democracies. Non-liberal countries, authoritarisms are more authoritarian when you look at Russia and China. You can, you can expand this picture. So the lower freedom level is here, the lower the freedom level is there starting 2008 since liberal capitalism myth collapsed something unpleasant. 
Kamila Gasiuk-Pichowicz. And this is the mic. Good afternoon. Thank you for thanks for having me here. There is no use in denying that we witness a specific crisis that affects liberal democracy in our region. We can see in Poland, in Hungary, the recent post-fascist victory in Italy, the right-wing government in Sweden. Well, we see that the strong populist slogans. Uh, predominate slowly in Europe. On the other hand, what I would like to say is that uh, some uncertainty in the lasting of liberal democracy is its characteristics. Nobody um, uh, promised in liberal values to be uh, permanent, that it's given once and forever, and a beautiful constitution would be uh, lasting. The mechanism of control and balance in Western liberal democracies have never in Polish democracy guaranteed stability because liberal democracies have always demanded something from pe the people. Involvement, participation, voting, searching for objective information, diligent information and the resilience to liberal democracy's chaos is proportional to our involvement in the def defense of these democracies. Recently, we've witnessed a number of crises throughout Europe. There was the migration crisis we can consider if it was uh, over overcome or not. There was the COVID crisis with immediate response from Europe, the historically greatest budget which Poland has not reached for yet due to the current government's decisions, a historic budget to recover European economies after the COVID crisis. We had the Brexit crisis. Now we are facing the uh, uh, problem how uh, the EU is going to cope with Russia. We see uh, one package by package of sanctions quickly agreed. We see Europe's reaction to the energy crisis that by several percent we managed to reduce our energy dependence on Russia. Within my field of expertise, that is justice, we could see quick response from the EU to the crisis that has happened. Please notice European jurisprudence, the European uh, Court of uh, Human Rights, the uh, Court of Justice, the European Commission to review annually and prepare reports on the condition of democracy in particular member states, a powerful mechanism that is supposed to force states to respect the foundations of the European Union, that is the conditionality mechanism. It works. Hungary, uh, Hungary has its 80% of budget suspended. Poland, in a moment, would also be affected by the effects of this mechanism. Milestones, all that shows that we can discuss whether it is these are all the steps the EU could have taken, but certainly some steps have been taken. And this is a characteristic of liberal democracies to defend through involvement, through innovativeness, looking for new solutions. Uh, I need to say that I'm looking into the future in an optimistic way. I trust that we are witnessing the we may be witnesses to to forging of even stronger bases that would reinforce liberal democracy i always remember with the Ch churchill saying do not waste a good crisis perhaps we should use the crisis to find mechanisms that would help us fight for what's important for us well, thank you very much. Indeed, we need the optimism, but we need to distinguish two things. The growing democracy awareness of liberal elites that 
understood liberal democracy as something as natural as fresh air, and now they see you need to fight for it, and it's good. So far, however, EKR has been receiving money from the European Parliament, though in its essence it breaches the uh, Parliament's provisions that only parties that respect European va uh, values can get the money, and nobody in the Parliament would opt to uh, take the money from them so, jo so the Jobro doesn't run his election campaign for the EU money. That's That tells us how slow this awareness is in growing. Unfortunately, among the societies, we see erosion instead of growing of awareness. It's easy to persuade politicians to democracy. Uh, far difficult it is in the case of societies. And Dr. Mirowska. Well, I'm still very happy that we consent. We are moderately optimistic, and uh, we are at a very problematic difficult. Every research proves that democracy is retreating. It's eroding somehow, both on the part of political elites that's why we have the growth of populism, but not just that. Populism has different faces. Populist political actors who uh, tend to act author in an authoritarian way and erosion of social attitudes in terms of democratic issues. If I well remember, uh, Fukuyama said, liberal democracy is no longer sexy. Why? I have this feeling that people feel they are out of control. They do not know what they need the state for, for whose businesses the state serves. The 24th of June, February changed absolutely everything about what is going to happen to liberal democracies in the region, but I trust there are three major threats. Obviously, the economic crisis security crisis related to what is happening in the East, and identity crisis. I trust that the uh, liberal democracy crisis, among many reasons, will have one related to the identity crisis. So tribes clash, I would say. There is a huge generation gap, and societies do not cope with that, and this is a true challenge. There are also new technologies that are a challenge. This information, in fact, these public discussion, discussions, discourses arranged by Russia on one hand that are based on nationalistic values, magic thinking. On the other hand, there is China uh, that in its disinformation narrative focus on economic issues. These are the challenges. Where are the opportunities? Opportunities for liberal democracy, I have this moderate optimist because of that. I find those opportunities in uh, foremostly we can use the crisis for a good cause. Each crisis carries an opportunity. For me, it comes from increasing uh, citizens' participation, deliberation understood as the value of liberal democracy, of clashing different ideas, concept. It would be difficult because of the polarization, not the one whether we are going to discuss economic issues or not. It's not dangerous. Polarization doesn't have to be negative for democracy. Democracy is conflict, is discussion, and polarization. Uh, in terms of different view on economic issues may be pretty positive, but polarization on the foundations is potentially highly dangerous. So it would be good to return to deliberation to bring people back the belief that it matters what they do, their opinions are listened to, trust in politicians, in the institutions of states, and in the state, the feeling it is my state. Another opportunity I can see is the role of the political party parties. 
Political studies have been proclaiming the end of political parties for many years. What's the role of the parties? I think we are entering a stage where parties, if they play it well, can have their very moment meaning representation. We have a representation crisis because the citizens do not feel it is my state, somebody represents my interest. So this is the opportunity for political parties, and we see some movements. Parties are going down to people. There is this reactivation of direct communication, and it is a positive trend, in my opinion. I, I feel that parties in Poland, as I observe, go down to people, and if that trend enhances, that will be good, because the gap between political elites and the uh, voting people Contrary to, to the theory, the, the, the parties are getting down to the people. Then strengthening the role of political parties is by emerging political elites. That is vital. Uh, that can protect American democracy from full devastation uh, from Trump and post-Trump period. So parties need to take care and strengthen the quality of emerging elites. And thirdly, where I can see the opportunity to leave the democracy crisis is broadly understood quality. P populists are not effective. They reduce the quality of uh, democracies. They do not solve problems. They are good at diagnosing, but they do not, do not diagnose for public interest, but they diagnose to win power. Winning power is nothing bad from the perspective of political studies. Somebody has to do that. And it's good that politicians desire power. The point is, why? This is fundamental. And indeed, I have this feeling that the governance quality, the quality of relations between political actors and uh, the constituencies, and thirdly, the quality of political communications with the journalists. I see a crack in communication culture between politicians and journalists, and I assume in that uh, recovery process, as we say, democracy is demanding. It's not that somebody will fix it for us for us, for German, for Hungary, for others in crisis. You, we need to do it ourselves. It's great if the EU gets involved, but journalists, politicians, society, integration or synchronizations of actions, and these are the areas I see that, in my opinions, are the opportunity for constructive overcoming of the liberal democracy crisis, which doesn't mean peace forever, but it will teach us to care for democracy, and it is not given once and forever. That's why we needed this crisis. Thank you. We are pretty uh, fluent. Thank you for the discipline. The issue that we have is that to have it as we used to have, everything needs to change, to quote the classic. To change, those in control need to consent. Doctor, you mentioned a vital thing, participation, deliberation. Is there at least one sign, say for uh, Belgium, that the political elites inclined to give part of their power to the deliberation mechanism, like panels, citizens' panels, create them, OK, listen to them, OK, but give power, decision-making panels, no. Another example, redistribution. How many examples do we have of societies in Europe that are ready to increase taxes to have higher redistribution so that bring relief to those who are excluded, who feel excluded. It, it won't uh, be okay in Poland, I think. 
If now Coalitia Obywatelska recommends 80% uh, pit for the richest, it would be gone in an instant. The question goes to you. How do you think what and to what extent the Democrats can sacrifice to defend democracy in Europe, Central Eastern Europe included? Crystal, if you could begin, please. conceptual idea that's really important in understanding what the public and perception would be willing or not willing to do and what would um, bring more solidarity within communities has a lot to do with this idea of populism and authoritarianism because populism if we there's a way to define populism attitudinally you can actually measure a person's propensity or agreement with um, populist ideas and populist ideas are uh, anti-elite and they believe that the people are better decision makers and so populism in itself is actually not a threat to democracy people who are high on the populism scale do not threaten democracy because they actually want more democracy and the the so the idea of citizens panels and giving power to the people I think is really important but there's a um, a critical piece of that, which is what is the expectation and what is the result? It can't be pretending to give power. It has to then actually be designed in a way that is more binding. Otherwise, there's this um, heightened sense of participating and having decision-making power nested with the people that's disappointed. And that is terrible because it will dri drive those people who support democracy more toward authoritarian perspectives. The authoritarian way of thinking or worldview is also um, well described and, and you, can, you can measure it, you can benchmark it in society just by asking people questions. And what it actually is authoritarianism, which is distinct from populism, is wanting order, it's wanting uniformity, and it usually demands a strong leader or leadership. And so these aspects of having an authoritarian tendency can easily be used and abused to lend power to those who would hollow out a democracy, who would use the people in order to consolidate their own power and then move the state on the spectrum we were talking about earlier in the presentation toward aut autocracy. And so I think when we talk about taxes, and who would pay them and how they'd be levied. It's not so much taxes, yes or no, but it's about the fairness and then if those taxes actually help people. I think if you could see a direct influence on the reduction of inequality in society, the reduction of suffering in society, I think many people, their um, willingness to um, make that kind of collective sacrifice would be there. Um, and I think just as a last thought, this is about freedom as well, right? Because um, one of the ways we perceive freedom is about individual freedom. Me, I want to be able to do things without limits. And then there's this conundrum, this dilemma in democracy, which is where is the individual freedom balanced with the freedom of those who live in our communities? And I think taxes are a good a good practical example of this, right? And those freedoms have to be balanced and seen as fair and benefiting society. Thank you very much indeed. Two points. Uh, first, the democracy point and identity point is a little bit connected with it. I think there is a perceived but also a real democratic deficit in the world as we see it today. One cannot simply say that if you transform more and more power to international institutions, which as such is a good thing, uh, that you do not somehow damage democracy because then you have negotiations between executives. Even the EU will never be put into, uh, uh, transferred into a democracy just like many national states are. And we have to uh, think about uh, uh, how to translate this negative nationalism into a debate and how to structure democracy, the relationship between dem 
democracy and governance within the EU, talking about the principle of subsidiarity, which I think is very much toothless at the moment because the EU itself decides who can do it uh, 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 better. We haven't done the discussion, and so we have something that is perceived as not really democratic, is obviously unable to solve certain problems. We knew that there was a problem with Russia and all these things. We knew it all the time. It wasn't, didn't do anything, but fumbles into what type of cheese should be sold. Uh, th that's very efficient. And I think one could have a discussion on that, a renegotiation on that, and that, because that makes fe people feel uneasy about democracy. Second, redistribution. If the answer to economic exclusion is just redistribution, we will be very poor off. I'm, I'm sure that will end dramatically in the wrong direction. Because, I mean, uh, we have enumerated already a lot of crises. Ukraine, one of the things, uh, climate, everything. But also we see the intergenerational problem. We see that the welfare state, the redistributive welfare state, obviously will in the next years, when people like me retire, at least in the Western Europe, run into deep problems. And we will have heavy spending on something that does not produce anything constructive, just keeps people somehow alive. What has to be done is a strategy that makes the economy work, make it grow protectively and create jobs, uh, dynamics, innovation, not just for a few. Or so that is the strategy we should follow, not just redistribution, because I think if you have people and I've been working on many indices similar uh, to this, and we always try to, to, to uh, uh, correlate with this. If you have people who are, uh, if you have a majority of people who are live somehow just on government support, taxpayers' money, you will not have content citizens. That's what it does not produce. Freer countries with freer, econo uh, freer economies also usually produce some or more content citizens. And that's what we should think about it. It's a very difficult decision in these crises we have. But that's, if, if somebody can tackle these problems, I think then we could probably even beat populism. Then. This redistribution is uh, even more important. Liberal democracy in our region not only does defend against internal challenges, the erosion of belief in a liberal democracy, but this is a real combat with autocratic superpowers of this world. And we need to win with economic efficiency. An internal battle needs to be won by sacrificing some of the efficiency to unity. And this is gargantuan historic challenge for politicians. Kamila Gasiuk Pichowicz, indeed, saying that peace will leave Poland in bad condition is to say nothing. Huge challenges Europe is facing will overlap. And opposition's victory will not make these problems disappear. These will not be solved. We'll learn about many of these, but there is no need to say that there are only sweat and tears because we can solve many problems earlier, less painfully. Can Poles bear the cost of defense of democracy to a lesser extent compared to Germans or French? I am convinced that they are unable to bear the costs in a smaller uh, level, on a smaller scale than French or Germans. I believe that citizens in every democracy can ex accept difficult solutions. Can I chop in? Because devotion to the benefit of the group is associated with intensity of trust in a group. Eastern Europe, including Poland in particular, has lower level compared to Western countries when it comes to general trust. Most probably less likely to devote to benefit the group. We mask it with nationalism, but they are in a symbolic sphere. 
and if we speak about practical um, sacrifices, there is a difference. You are saying there is no difference between Germans and Poles. There is. There is trust level difference. Indeed. But what happened in February this year made Europeans realize how important it is to keep a foundation European Union is based on rule of law, protection of human rights, independence of courts of law. This is the foundation that made it possible to create elite club of democratic countries. And this can be seen, tough regime that does not respect uh, these and peaceful countries that can develop in economic and calm way. European countries realize that if you destabilize big country as Poland is, 38 million of European citizens is a quite a big share in European Union scale. Such countries cannot think peacefully about their future, their stable development, and there is much to fight for because the bloody regime that is being built on undemocratic uh, rules, so different from the European Union, is closer to, and closer to European Union borders. So how can we uh, defend liberal democracy as politicians? I should agree with you, what you said. What is most important is to listen, to solve problems. Third of all, to give people feeling of subjectivity. And I think that Polish and uh, not only Polish anti-democrats will be removed from powers because they cannot do that. They mistake listening with lying, constant lying, with distribution, constant distribution of li lies in public sphere. They cannot solve any problem. You can see in Poland ventilators, uh, coal supply, these autocrats confuse populism with subjectivity and it's, it's democrat tasks to fulfill three basic needs of uh, citizens. And I want to highlight it, autocracy, dictatorships purely, poorly uh, cope with crises. Piłsudski said that um, knives uh, and sabers are very useful, but it's difficult to sit on them for a long time. Creative ones win. Autocracies do not uh, promote talents. They promote mediocre, average, but faithful people. This is what we see in Poland. We can see this in Poland. Societies are ready to devote much to democracy only when they see they can lose democracy. Ukraine is yet another example. Not only they fight for freedom, they aspire to be a part of the European Union, NATO, the alliances of democratic world. This is the best confirmation. Although Ukraine hasn't had good uh, experiences, oligarchs in uh, economy and uh, moguls in the seats uh, and societies are not ready to devote uh, to to sacrifice you can see it in russia because there's the con constrict being uh, called in russia and russians are escaping from this not always the societies see this they come to conclusion too late and they discover they might lose democracy and this is the role of all the leaders that should give out a red flag. Um, also, experts, politicians, journalists should do that. So I take up this responsibility. We owe a lot to Putin. He showed what the dictatorship final is, what it may lead to. And I believe that many people 
have started to perceive the competition between the systems, liberal democracy and authoritarian regimes. There is a big group of people in Poland, not only amongst populists, but also in Western countries, not only extravagant ones, yet big group of people say, right, look at China. They are doing quite well. In 2008, there was an economic decline, and they are heading forward despite the fact that we are unable to rebound. If somebody is going to Beijing, they are joyful because, you know, Beijing should be in Warsaw, some say. A book was published a few years ago, Beijing Consensus. For many people, it's sexy. The new sex appeal. Democratic countries are, are developing this way, nationalization and similar ones. I'm afraid it's not easy. And the example of this scary Putin is not example. If there is Chinese success, that is a carrot. Dr. Brodzinska Miroska. Four minutes, and each of you, uh, one minute intervention. I agree with what she said with regards to China. I mentioned about it a few minutes ago. You can gain a lot economy wise, but you can turn a blind eye on liberal democracy values. This is pretty dangerous. And this is the basis for left-wing populism, the other side of the spectrum. Chinese bring in offers and they are not asking about the rule of law. They say, yeah, we offer lucrative solutions to boost economic competition and they pay under the table. From the point of liberalism and crisis, it's dangerous here. In our discussion, I'd like to draw attention to one thing, sacrifice thing. Seven years ago, there was Professor Markovsky's research, English team, which indicated that the CEE society diagnosed insufficiencies or gaps in democracy quite aptly. So we can feel that people see that and understand it. But the question is different when it comes to sacrifice, especially in economic dimension, in polarized environments. Not only is this Polish problem, it is the problem of the, the countries that fa uh, face erosion. There is the fight of tribes, kind of. So there is a group of people that feels exploited by the state. Why should they share? And the other thing, a strong state, liberal democracy guarantees a strong state in the context of what you're saying. If it is strong, protecting institutions, developing citizens' trust, citizens, I'm not speaking about Poland, that is a different story. They accept differently higher taxation question if they trust the state and they see what the money is spent on, what is the quality of services delivered as a part of the tax contribution. Democracies that are doing quite well in the countries with high taxations, we can see the sense of paying taxes. People can see the sense. They trust. Polarized societies say, why should I contribute? And go and pay for kachor. It's fundamental. This is a question of freedom, foundation of liberal democracy. Where is this equality in a situation where one has to work a lot? They carry the burden of heavy taxes, others do not pay anything. So the employment uh, question should be tackled by liberal democracy. Where does wealth, wealth come from? Where does wealth come from? From work or from something else? So when there is polarization, as far as the foundations are concerned, the social ability to um, carry the burden to the first uh, democracy might be different. But still, 24th of February changed everything. Even if there were no doubt, if there were doubts, social perception of what is happening in Ukraine, we think 
many people have the feeling of relief that we are a part of the European Union and it's worth not deepening of what is happening here because we might have been in a different place. The tragedy that touched Ukraine shows that we should play a different game, a romance with totalitarianism may lead you astray. The EU policy uh, has strengthened its policy because if Putin is the alternative, you know it. One minute for each of you for final contribution. And the question is, what saves liberal democracy in CE? Crystal. Thank you. In I think one element is actually all of our identities and your identity in particular. Because we know from the attitudinal data that people feel mostly their national identity. So in this case, Polish and then European. And we forget that people's identities are so core and important into how they conceptualize and understand the world. And we've left the idea of national identity uh, to the extreme authoritarians for far too long. And I think <clears throat> going forward, it will be important to define what Polish is and what being Polish is in the current world, in the current context, and not to leave this to the extremists. Thanks. Thank you very much, Detmar. Well, I think uh, the only strategy we can win is A, to reform our institutions, that people have the feeling it is something fair to them, it is democratic, uh, tangibly democratic, and that we produce results, that we do follow policies that do not imitate the strategies of populists. I mean, you can answer all this. Uh, your government here in Poland says, let's increase the pensions 20%, we say 30% or so, go into race, or all these new economies of the, whether it's China or democratic populism, are privileged economies. And we have to revive open economies, open societies, and we have, for instance, I think, make globalization work, which we didn't, we forgot totally about in the last years. Pani Paseu. MP, in history we had crises which were disregarded and there was a huge price to pay after that. All continent paid for that. All those who experienced these crises have taken a farewell, but the memory about crises is a living one. You can see it with the example of Ukraine's world war. Western world had no doubts. You need to stand by the victim. The victim needs to be helped. And this awareness that aggressors' victory will be dangerous for whole Europe was omnipresent. And in discussions, 1939 was often referred to. I think that Post realized that there is checks and balances principle that is omnipresent in Europe. And in Poland, we have juxtaposition of one omnipotent uh, president of PIS. There is the legal anarchy in Poland, and PIS opposes European solidarity with nationalistic egoism. I need to chop in one sentence. In the meantime, if we want to have this European solidarity, we need to exercise this solidarity towards other EU countries. If our independence is to be guaranteed by European Union, it needs to be strengthened, not weakened. Thank you very much. Doctor, Re restoration of democratic order. Belief, belief that the state should be strong, and a strong state is to the interest of politicians, people, society. We can do it through deliberation, transparency, trust for public institutions, and discussion against divisions, looking for common denominators, what brings us together. Thank you very much. Hope to see you. It's not always you easy to recognize. That, but we were it may look like by this. Or like this. It may be a burden. But it is a responsibility that we embrace nonetheless. 
But if it means this for one person and this for someone else, maybe it ultimately means being there for one another. It isn't handed to us, but we know where to find it and how it feels, how it tastes, and what it sounds like when we finally have it. It means different things to different people, but for many, it means everything. And if we all fight for it, it will eventually bring us together. Atlas Network is, as the name suggests, a network, and it's global. We work all around the world. We're based in the U.S. We have about 159 partners in uh, the United States right now, and the bulk of our partners are outside, nearly 500 in total. Atlas Network, it connects people uh, from all over the world, defending the idea of uh, human dignity, uh, defending human rights and personal liberties. Atlas Network is focusing on, I think, the most important and moral cause in the entire world. We partner with local innovators, local leaders who understand conditions on the ground in communities facing real challenges. We look at the people from the worldwide freedom movement that are passionate, are ready to make a difference, understand local conditions, and we invest in them. At Atlas Network, we unleash individual ingenuity to enrich humanity. The United States does not have a lock on the idea of freedom and liberty. Those ideas are beyond borders. 
One of the main goals of Atlas Network is to eradicate poverty around the world, and we do that by investing millions of dollars in our partners' work every year. Historically, uh, wealthy nations around the world have tried to help low-income countries develop. The way we've been doing it traditionally has not really been working. So there's a movement to do development differently, and that means we need to step back as outsiders and rethink the role that we're playing in helping people in low-income countries achieve their dreams. We want to make the world a better place. We want to make the world a freer world. All of us want to leave a legacy and be part of something big to make a better world. This is exactly the work of Atlas Network. With our growing number of hundreds of successful partners, we're stronger than ever. Changing the world. Changing the world. Changing the world. Starts together with us. us.